to celebrate that one small child, but we're not only here to celebrate his birth, but we're here to celebrate his life, death, but most of all, his resurrection. He came, God became flesh and dwelt among us to live on this earth, to die for your sins and mine. Let us worship him this morning. Let's stand together as we sing the first Noel. Good morning, and welcome to East Lake Road Alliance Church. Noel, Noel, born is the king of Israel. Wow, as we approach Christmas and think about all the things that God did for us by sending his son, Jesus Christ. What a gift. 
and we celebrate it. If you're visiting with us today, we celebrate it every single time we meet at East Lake Road Alliance Church, the birth of Jesus Christ, Christmas and Easter. Not only the fact that he came, but that he came to give his life as a ransom for mankind's sin. What a wonderful, wonderful, uh, uh, what a wonderful, wonderful God we serve, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Messiah. We welcome you to East Lake Road Alliance Church, uh, and I'm supposed to tell you what I love about East Lake Road. Now, I did this once before, and the people in the first service don't remember what my favorite thing about East Lake Road Alliance Church. You know now, and you won't tell. My favorite thing about East Lake Road Alliance Church is the pastor's wife. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I love you as well. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Good to be a part of a wonderful family of God, and I, I welcome you to East Lake Road Alliance Church this morning. I want to remind you of a few things, especially our, our Christmas services, Christmas Eve at uh, 4.30 and 6 o'clock, Christmas Eve service. We uh, invite you to come put on your counter and to invite others. And we're making it easy for you to invite others. Ann McQuist and our outreach director has developed a little card shape of a business card. It's a beautiful little giveaway, and you can take a bunch of those that are out there in the narthex and pass them out to your friends and family. Invite them to come to the services at East Lake Road Alliance Church. Also, ladies, the ladies' Bible studies now are uh, done until we get into uh, January. I think it's January 13th. They'll resume on Wednesday night, um, so be aware of that. Also, immediately following this service, we've got a great lunch plan. I was back there checking on it, and let me tell you, it looks really good. I'm going to try to recall what they've got back there. Broccoli and cheddar soup. Chicken noodle soup. And homemade, let me tell you, homemade. And Italian wedding soup. Sub sandwiches. And for dessert, there's cookies and brownies. We encourage you, if you didn't sign up, to come. We, we got extra, so we're inviting you to come to the lunch and immediately following the service. And we're going to give you the opportunity to, share, to sing one more Christmas song, Away in a Manger. team for leading us in those beautiful songs of the season. How about those kids, huh? Yeah. We got the greatest kids, don't we? We got the best looking group of kids in all of Erie County right here at East Lake Road Alliance Church. So you make sure you bring your kids to be part of our children's programs. It's wonderful to see them just doing those kinds of things in the service. It, it thrills my heart. Will you join your hearts with mine as we seek the Lord together in prayer this morning? Precious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in this place and to just lift our voice in praise, to be a part, Lord God, of the family of God here at East Lake Road Alliance Church, to honor you, Lord Jesus, with our, our voices. And I pray, Lord God, that these songs have come up to you, a sweet and fragrant offering, 
from hearts and lips that are deeply in love with Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for the season, for Christmas, and what it means. God with us, Emmanuel. Oh, the depth and breadth of the love of God that would provide a Savior for mankind. Thank you for your awesome love, your awesome grace, your awesome mercy. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship of the Spirit. We know, Lord God, that you are present with us. We thank you for the fellowship of believers. And we are reminded once again today, Lord God, that we have uh, many of our people, especially our elderly, are shut in today. And the desire of their heart would be to be here in this place worshiping you. We pray, Lord God, that by your Spirit's presence they might sense in a very tangible uh, way your loving arms literally around them today, loving on them, Lord God, as we lift them to the throne. For those of our congregation, Lord God, who are in the hospital and uh, those who are traveling, we would pray also that you would be a very real presence with them right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what we've already experienced here today in this place. We're going to praise you for what is yet to come. We ask you to meet each and every one of us right at our point of need. And if there be one here today who does not know you as Lord and Savior, that today, Lord God, they would do business with you and believe in the true gift of Christmas, Jesus Christ. Have their sins forgiven and have eternal life in you. We pray all of these things in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Healer, and most assuredly, Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. We love you, Lord, and all God's people said, Amen, Amen, amen and Amen. We're going to ask the men to come forward, or those who are going to collect the morning tithes and offerings to come forward to prepare to do that. And I do want to remind you of the tear-off sheet that's in your bulletin. I would ask you to get that out, fill it out, drop it in the offering place that comes around to you. If you have any uh, prayer requests, we'll make sure we pray for you. If you have any questions regarding the church or anything at all about service, those kinds of things, fill that out, put it on the offering plate, and we'll make sure we uh, respond to you. Now, just before we take the material tithes and offers, we've got a couple of minutes. Would somebody like to give a verbal tithe of praise? Uh, to the Lord this morning for something maybe he has done in your life recently. Anybody want to give a verbal tithe of praise? Yes, Nancy Rose. Praise. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. You know, thank you for reminding us that sometimes we take the most... Um, uh, common of things and take them for granted until we can't do it. Thank, thank you for that, reminding us. God is so good to us. Somebody else a word of praise. You happy to be alive this morning? Yeah. Uh, amen. I don't know about you all, but I am happy to be alive and to be here with you this morning. Okay. Uh, if not, um, would you, brother, ask the blessing on the offer? Amen. And thank you, Lord, for the children's ministry here. They're very awesome. You guys are great. That was beautiful. And the Lord shining down upon you. And thank you, Lord, for just everybody here that can make it. And we pray for the ones that couldn't make it. And that they see the Lord no matter what. Amen. Thank you, Tom. God bless you.
Thank you, Jen, for that beautiful offertory. Oh, come, let us adore him. That's what we're here today to do, just to adore the Lord, and it's a perfect lead into the sermon. All right, kids, you want to go to junior church? All right. There they go. After all that, they still got all that energy left. Wow. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, if you've been around for the past couple of weeks, you know we're looking at uh, this Christmas season, the, the songs of Christmas, and we talked for the past two weeks, we looked at Zachariah's song. Today we're going to look at the music of the angels and the shepherds, and we find this account in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. We're going to look at that in a, in a few minutes. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there and just put your finger there and hold on to it again. Hold on to it for a moment or two. I want to remind you that these songs of Christmas that we're preaching about, again, these are the last of the Hebrew Psalms and the first of the Christian songs. And it really ties our faith in Christ back to our roots in, in ancient uh, Hebrew, ancient Judaism. So I want to remind you of that. Last week we looked at Zechariah and some of the characters involved around the, the birth of John the Baptist and the angel's announcement to him and of course, his song of praise. Today, we're going to look at the, the shepherds, and we're going to see the, the, the uh, message in the song of the angels that uh, the angels brought to them. And I recently read of a survey that was done regarding which characters from the Advent account that most people uh, identify with. And you think about that for a moment, and, and think about who you identify, you know, you, who you identify with, and who you would think that most people uh, identify with the characters of the Advent account. I wonder if it would be Mary or Joseph. Maybe you identify with one of those. Or the wise men. I hope a lot of us would identify ourselves with the wise men uh, seeking the Lord. I hope nobody would identify themselves with, with Herod. I don't think so. But not surprisingly, maybe, the people that we're going to look at today come out on top by far. The shepherds are the people that in the, in the biblical account of the birth of Christ that most people identify them with. And they come out on top by far. I think in some aspect, all of us can identify with the shepherds. Maybe because they were common people that carried with them all the flaws that come with being uh, a human being. Our account reminds us that it was the shepherds who received the good news about the gift of God, the gift of Christmas, that keeps on keeping on and giving and giving and giving. And because of what they did with the gift, we too can sing joyfully to the world. I find it interesting that God chose to send the birth announcement about His Son to the shepherds. Now, Luke chapter 2, verse 8, doesn't tell us much about who they were. No adjectives are used in the account to describe them. It just simply says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Interesting. Now, we know that throughout the early history uh, of Israel, shepherding had been a noble profession. If you think about it, Abel was the first one to have the job. And he was followed by Abraham as a shepherd, Isaac, Jacob, Moses was a shepherd. And maybe most famously, David was a shepherd. God calls himself a shepherd, and then he compares us to sheep, which, by the way, is not a flattering comment. He compares us to sheep. But by the time we get to the first century, we find that shepherding had lost a lot of its luster. Shepherds made up at this point in time, this point in history that we're going to look at, one of the lowest classes of people. I understand they came in just ahead of lepers in their society. So in order for us to understand how unusual it would have been to have angels appear to these lowly shepherds, we need to know a bit more about them. Now at the time of Christ, at the time that the announcement came, we understand that shepherds would have been ceremonially, religiously unclean. Because of the nature of their work, they were unable to attend many of the religious services of the time. Even though historians believe that these shepherds that the angel appeared to that night 
were probably the shepherds who were taking care of the flocks that were being raised to be temple sacrifices in the temple in, in, in Jerusalem. These would have been people who would have been isolated and forgotten because their flocks needed to move around to find new grass and fresh water. They, they never could stay in one place too long. I've had the privilege of being there several times and being in those shepherd's fields. And they're anything but a pasture like we have in America. I mean, there's just strings of grass, not much. So the shepherds had to constantly be moving, constantly be moving to find these sheep food and, and water. We understand that they would have been treated in that day with mistrust and even contempt. Their testimony was not allowed in several courts because they were so unreliable. They would have been known to be brash and bold men living out in the fields away from society. Made them unappealing to most people. Yet, God entrusted the greatest message ever sent to, human, to humankind from heaven to a group of very plain and ordinary men. Maybe, actually, that's really not so unusual when we know what God's word says. God has always worked wonders for the forgotten, for the despised, and for the lowly. From the very beginning of his time on earth, Jesus came to those who were in bad shape, but who were willing to humble themselves. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus said this, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus reached out to sinners all the time, like Zacchaeus, like Levi. He reached out to prostitutes and the demon-possessed. He reached out to strangers. He reached out to Samaritans. He did in his ministry what the father did in a borrowed stable when the lowly shepherds looked at the Lord as the cattle were lowing. Now Mary, Mary captured this in her song. We have it for you uh, recorded in Luke chapter 1, verse 52. Mary talked about this. And we're going to look at Mary's song in the next week or so. He said, he, she said, he has brought down rulers from, the, from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians, and I think that this passage in 1 Corinthians is a good reminder to you and I as we think about the great gift of Christmas, the fact that God, Emmanuel, came to live with us. Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and it should resonate down through the ages to us today here at East Lake Road Alliance Church as we consider what God did for us. Paul said, brothers, think not of what you were when you were called, thinking back on the uh, the, uh, what we were before we came to Jesus Christ. He said, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and to despise things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. What a good reminder it is to you and I today, Christmas time, 2015, to remember what we were before Christ called us, those who know Christ as our personal Savior. It should humble us. It should cause us to fall more deeply in love with Jesus Christ, the Savior. God entrusted this message, the greatest one ever sent from heaven, to very plain and humble people. Notice this, that the scriptures don't say there were in the same region, region kings watching over their subjects or scribes watching over their scrolls. The Lord comes to the lowly. He comes to what the world would consider the most undeserving, to the neglected, to the, to the marginalized in order to show his power, to show his great love for all humanity, to show his great mercy. The shepherds help us to see that God has a message for sinners, just like you and, and just like me. It, it shows us the, the, the broad and deep truth that everyone matters to God. You know, you might think that, that you don't matter to many people. You might think that you don't matter even to your friends or to your family or that the world doesn't think much of you. I got good news for you this morning. You matter to God. That's what 
this whole account yells out at us, we matter to God. The announcement of Christ's birth goes out to a bunch of uneducated, normal, ordinary people. Indeed, as the song says, what a strange way to save the world. As we look at the uh, shepherd's response, as we look at the angel's song, we're going to see some lessons we can apply to our lives so that we too can sing a song of joy this Christmas, if only in our hearts. Let's turn to the account and, and, and read. Again, Luke chapter 2, beginning in, in verse 8. And if it's at all possible, I would encourage you, you know, sometimes these scriptures become so commonplace because we know the, we know the story. We know the account. We take it for granted, just like Nancy reminded us. We take things for granted. Don't ever take the Word of God for granted. Try to look at it today with, with fresh eyes, like maybe you never heard it before. Put yourself back in this place. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. If you're an underliner, I would encourage you to underline that you in that verse. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing. Here's another place where you want to underline that has happened. They didn't go to Bethlehem and say, let's go see if this thing is going on, if it's really true. They said, let's go see this thing that has happened. They believed, and there's a really powerful message right there, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned to glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this word of God. I pray, Lord God, that as we look into it, that we might see it afresh and anew. And Lord, as we talk about it, that you would hide this poor preacher once again behind the cross of Christ, that you would speak to us by your word, Lord God, in your spirit's presence, that you would be magnified in this place today. Pray all this again in the name of Jesus and with much thanksgiving. Amen. Okay, so we continue to set the scene here. We have this angelic intervention take place when God rocks the routine of some men who are just doing their job. These men were just out in the field another evening of watching over the sheep. Now, you've got to see the commonality in these Christmas accounts. The commonality with this one and the one we looked at last week Zechariah was just in the temple doing his job, just going about his routine, and God shows up in a mighty way. The shepherds were just out in the field taking care of their sheep, going about their day-to-day -day business, and God shows up. Listen, dear hearts, we believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that what he did then, he is still doing now. Do we believe that? So we can expect God to show up every now and then and do something tremendous. That's the way God works. God steps into our daily routine. He shows up. And when we are tuned into what he is doing, we are changed forever by his presence with us. God wants to rock our world today. I know he does. He wants to send help. He wants to change our situation just like he did for Zechariah and like he did for these men. Anyway, they're out there doing their routine. I wonder if we expect God ever to show up. Do you expect anything from God ever, or do you just come to church because 
you feel like it's the religious thing to do. Those of you who are saved, do you remember when God showed up and changed your world? God wants to show up in your life today. He wants to change your world. Oh, why don't you let him do it? Anyway, they're keeping watch over their flocks. So whatever sheep are doing, that's what the sheep are doing. They're doing their sheep stuff. You know, I'm not much of a farmer, but they're bleeping or whatever sheep do. Bob. Just a normal night. Amen. And the Lord shows up. It says an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And I think sometimes, again, the Bible, the Bible is so understated in, 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 in you know, the reading of it. It understates these things so much for us because we can't comprehend it anyway. They're out there. The sheep are doing their thing. They're, they're, the shepherds are doing their thing. And all of a sudden, this angel appears to them. Now, I, try to imagine this. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. Not only that, then it says, the glory of the Lord shone around them. I was just out in Montana on a hunting trip. One of the things I love about going out in, in these places where there's not uh, light pollution is that when you get up early in the morning or you're out there late at night when the sky is pitch black and the stars are so visible. It's like you can reach out and grab them and pull them down. There's so many. And you think about the fact that God the Creator just kind of threw those out in the sky, threw them out and named every one of them, billions of them. I don't know how many there are. But I imagine it was like that kind of a night. I imagine that the, that the shepherds were out there and maybe, maybe just you know, taking it all for granted, and all of a sudden an angel shows up, and the glory of the Lord shone. I can't imagine the brilliance of that. What that must have been like. Tremendously powerful, awesome sight. Into the darkness of that night comes the brightness and the glory of the Lord. The shepherds must have been surely shaking in their sandals that night. In fact, it says they were terrified. It means that they were extremely alarmed, extremely agitated, and it's totally understandable. And then the angel says to them, again, you see the commonality here of the angels went in the Christmas story. Do not fear. The angel has to tell humans once again, do not fear. Do not fear. It's the same thing the angel told Zechariah. Do not fear. Some of us this morning come in with fear. You know, we, we do have things that if we let the world in would, 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 would scare us. I don't know how people today live without a close relationship with Jesus Christ and not be on some psychotic drug or in some hospital somewhere. The world gives us a lot to fear. There's a lot going on. You may have come in today and you, you might be fearful about your job. You might be fearful about the economy. You might be fearful about what's going on with your children or your grandchildren. You might be fearful about your marriage. I don't know. There's a lot of things that the world can cause us to fear about this morning. But the same Jesus, the same messengers have the same announcement to you today. Do not fear. Do not fear. You know, that's something we can celebrate at Christmas. We don't have to be afraid. Amen. Now, we can choose to, but we don't have to be. We know that God is in control. We don't have to fear for our health. Even if we're sick, even unto death, we don't have to fear because we know that God is just going to use that to bring us to a better place. We've got a lot of things to be thankful for at Christmas. We do not have to fear. Do not fear. They were afraid. They'd been waiting for 400 years to hear from God. Can you imagine the silence? The reason the shepherds did not need to be afraid is because the messenger was bringing good news of great joy. Now, I think fear could be a good thing, by the way. I'm going to get off subject here for just a moment because I, I've said this before, but I may have some visitors and you haven't heard me before. I think what's missing in America today and most of society and even in our churches is a fear of the Lord. We have no fear of God. Even in the church, that's why we can come to church on Sunday and go live like the world the rest of the week. We have no fear of God. We just don't think he's going to intervene. 
Yet we have account after account of God intervening. We have his promise to intervene. We have his promises. The Bible says this about the fear of the Lord. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The beginning of wisdom. Without the fear of the Lord, we have no wisdom. But like these men who we are going to look at today, their fear, their fear of the Lord was eventually replaced with faith. And that faith eventually reached their feet. We could, we could call this sermon, Fear, Faith, and Feet. <laughs> That's what happens when we, when we fear God. We get, a, we, we get a healthy fear of God. It's always the same. God's the same. We get a healthy fear of God when we fear Him enough to humble ourselves before Him and believe in Him. That fear turns to faith, and that faith causes our love for Christ to grow. I remember when I came to Jesus, man, the first, the, when I came to Christ and I knew that I was coming to him to accept him as my personal Savior, I had a fear of God. A fear of God drove me to my knees in humility because I knew I wasn't worthy of a holy God. Nobody is. But the more I walked with him, the more I, I, I recognized him in all the things of life, the more I was obedient to him. That fear became a stronger and stronger faith which resulted in more and more love for Jesus. I don't fear him. I fear to fail him. But I love him. Fear turned to faith and then faith got to their feet. Anyway, this, the angel says, don't be afraid. I bring good news of joy. Now get this. I love this. This is another whole sermon. That's why we never get through a passage of Scripture at East Lake Road Alliance Church. I bring you good news for all people. The good news is that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, for all mankind. That means if you're sitting here today and you're a human being, God sent His Son for you. Amen. Amen. He loves you. Again, you may not think that the, and the world may not think much of you, but God thinks a whole bunch about you. He loves you so much that he sent his son. Now, the angels say, good news is for all people. But he goes on to say, he goes on to say, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Do you see, God came for all people, but to know him as Savior, it becomes very personal. I've had this discussion many times with my family because, the, you know, their, their response to it is you've got to know Christ is your personal Savior. It's got to be personal. No, God came for all people. He came to forgive all sin. Yeah, he did, but you better make it personal. What's that mean? That means that you've got to admit that you're a sinner. You've got to agree with God, that you can't save yourself, and that Christ came that you might have forgiveness of sin, that he gave himself up for you. He shed his blood for your sins personally. Yes, he came for all people, but you got to make it personal. Until you get it on a personal level, it doesn't mean anything to you personally. Oh. Today in the town of David, the Savior has been born to you. Christ the Lord, this will be a sign to you. will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. That phrase, good news, dear hearts, is where we get the word to evangelize. It's good news of great joy. The Greek word here is mega, great, big, exceedingly large, exceedingly loud, mighty. It's a superlative. In the greatest degree, isn't that the way God loves us? Wycliffe translates it this way in his translation. He says, I evangelize to you a great joy. You and I have been evangelized. We have the great news of Jesus Christ. The message is for all people, but it's for you as well. Now picture this. As the shepherds are trying to handle this visit from one angel and the glory of the Lord shone around them, I mean, it would be enough for anybody to try to get a grip on. They're taken back again. It says, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God. Can you even begin to imagine? I mean, they're just, they're just wrapping themselves around one angel. And all of a sudden, a heavenly host appears unexpectedly. I imagine the sky filled with a multitude of messengers. That term heavenly host refers to the Lord's army 
this time, listen to what they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Can you even begin to imagine that in our finite minds, what these shepherds must have experienced that night? The wonder of it all. I would like to suggest to you this morning that we can share in the excitement of the shepherds this Christmas by allowing them to teach us through their actions and through their reactions a few things about Christmas. And again, I think we can sum up this account in just a couple of points. We're not going to get through them, but I think we can sum it up in a couple of points. And the first one is very similar we talked about last week with Zechariah. Until you go, you will never know. You remember Zechariah? He was quiet. The baby was born. He had a right. His name is John. And what happened? His tongue was loosed and he immediately began to praise God. See, there's got to be some feet with our faith. You'll never know until you go after witnessing this incredible display of unbridled adoration and praise from the heavenly host. The shepherds knew that they had to move. They knew they had to do something. Their life was completely changed now, and they had to move. Look what it says there. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing. That the, uh, that the Lord has done, which the Lord has told us about. They discuss what they should do, and evidently they're uma- unanimous in their decision to head to Bethlehem. And again, verse 16, I love it because it shows that their fear now had been replaced with faith. They believed, and their, feet, their faith went to their feet, and it says, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. There was no delay. It says, it says they, they, after they had, the angels had left them, they hurried to go see what God was doing. There's a sense of urgency. Again, something that is lacking probably in, in, in churches, society, uh, humanity in general. There is a lack of a sense of urgency. If, if, if you don't think that the world is in deep trouble today, You are completely out of touch with everything that is going on around us. This world is as dark, I would suggest to you today, as it was when those angels showed up and announced the birth of Christ. But when they knew that God was moving, when they knew that God had heard somebody's prayer, when they knew that God was sending His Son, they didn't wait around. They didn't, you know... (laughs) It must not have been a church service or a church organization. You notice they didn't go and form a committee to figure out whether they should go and see this thing that God had done. They didn't, they didn't do any of that stuff. They said, let's go see this thing that God has done. Let's go see it. What a reminder to you and I today that we need to have a sense of urgency about the business of the Lord. We need to find out where God is moving, and we need to get ourselves right in the center of where God is moving. You know, I'm reminded that the the, uh, Truth Project that we went through there a few years ago, the big question that was introduced in the Truth Project was this, the, the challenge. And I think it's a challenge that we need to hear over and over and over and over again. The challenge there was, do you really believe and he's talking to the church. Now, this was the, the moderator, Del Tackett. He was talking to the church. Do you really believe that what you say you believe is really real? Because if you believed as a Christian that what you say you believe is really real, it would change the way you do life. It would, it would change everything. We would have a sense of urgency. Listen, we are living in a day when prophecy after prophecy has been fulfilled, we're living in a day that the Bible tells us that our Lord and Savior is due. We should be praying like they prayed in the Old Testament, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. We have Psalm 144 there. I I shared this with you last week. The psalmist prayed this, part your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains. Well, God's going to do that again. Isaiah prayed the same thing. Lord, do you would rend the heavens. We need help. 
The human race is desperately in need of help. We're not progressing to a place where we're getting better, by the way, and it's good. we're going to bring in a utopia. That's not, you know that's, that can't happen. The best minds continue to try. But without Christ back on the scene, the world's going to remain a dark place. But he is coming back. And just like the day, the night that the, the shepherds saw the angel of the Lord coming and the, the glory of the Lord shone around them, you and I may be the generation. We may be the generation when Jesus Christ comes back on the scene. But dear hearts, you have to realize that he came the first time and humbled himself to put on flesh. He came and humbled himself that he might take your sin and my sin with him to the cross. He humbled himself to the grave only to defeat it that you and I might have eternal life. He proved himself who he was. He's not coming back the second time in humility. He's not coming back the second time as a helpless babe. Praise God, he's coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming to rule and reign. And when he comes, he's going to take his church with him. The question is, will you be a part of that? You know, they hurried off, found Mary and Joseph, and the baby who was lying in a manger. No delay. Speed. Come on. Hurry up. Let's go see this thing that's going on in Bethlehem. And you know, God is always in the business of inviting his creation to come to him. He's always in the business of inviting. If you study that word, come, in the Bible, you discover that it appears, I understand, I didn't count each one, about 1,640 times. The Almighty invites us to come to him. Do we have Psalm 66.5? I love this. The psalmist says, come and see what God has done. How awesome his works in man's benefit. God did what he did through his creation, through his son, through his handiwork, not to just glorify himself, although it all brings glory to him. He did it on man's behalf so that you and I might indeed have a Savior, enjoy the peace of God, know without a fact that we are eternally secure in Christ Jesus. That's love, dear hearts. He did it for man. Oh, you got to love him this morning. He's always inviting us. I'm reminded of what Philip said. You know what Philip said to Nathaniel in response to Nathaniel's skepticism about Jesus? He said, come and see. Come and see. Jesus is inviting us always to come and see. I wonder, I really don't wonder. I know what keeps us from coming to Jesus. I know what keeps us from, from bowing our knee to the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're worried about what people are going to think about us. That's pride. And we're just generally prideful people. Pride will keep us from humbling ourselves before the Lord. You know, why did, why did God come to the lowest of society? He came to the lowest of society telling us, showing us that he loves all mankind. He loves you. He doesn't think anything of position. You know, God could have came to the kings, the rulers of the day, and what that would have done would have kind of made it an exclusive club, you know. There's a lot of exclusivity in the world today. You know, if you're a millionaire or a billionaire, there's places you can go that... Uh, you could go as a millionaire or a billionaire that most, most people can't go. It's exclusive. God came to the lowest, not the highest. He came to the lowest so that all might come. Not the highest, so just a few could come. Come and see. In John 4, 29, the Samaritan woman was so moved by what Jesus told her about herself that she runs to tell others and makes this invitation. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? He invites us to come and see. Come and see. And then, we don't have to pay for what God wants to give us when we come to see him. 
We don't have to pay. We couldn't afford it anyway if we had to buy it. Our only responsibility is to come. I love what Isaiah said about this. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. We're going to have to wrap this up here. As the prophet was moved by the Spirit, he says, Come, look at this. All you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money. It's not an exclusive club. Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me. He says twice. Eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. He invites us over and over and over again to come to him and, 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 and have food and have drink that, that we'll never be hungry again for the real thing. We'll never be thirsty again for the real thing. He's talking about that thing, our soul, that lives for all of eternity. He says, come to me. I will feed you. Come to me. I will quench your thirst. The world is looking all over the place to fill itself up on things that don't matter. To quench a thirst that will never go away. Yet Jesus says, come and I give it to you freely. Oh, we have much to celebrate at Christmas. Especially if we know Christ is our personal Savior. Well, we can't finish this message up today. Maybe next week we'll get to it. Amen. We're going to close with a song that invites us to come. And if you're here this morning and God has spoken to your heart about anything, Jesus invites you, just like he invited the shepherds to come and see what God has done. If you want to come and pray, this altar is always open. You can come and pray all by yourself if you want somebody to pray with you. There'll be people to pray with you. But I encourage you, this Christmas, this Christmas, why don't you discover the real gift of Christmas? And that is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing. that Jesus himself said in an invitation he says you have not because you ask not God wants us to have that peace that joy that can only come from knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord just this last verse if you want to come you come come to Father, how we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray each and every person in this room knows you as their personal Savior. And this Christmas season, they'll be reminded what they have 
pray because of the great gift that you gave. I ask you, Lord God, to dismiss us in your grace and peace and pray that once again that the love of Jesus would be so real in our lives that we would be changed by it. Yes. That we have gone to find out what God is doing and that he's doing it in our lives. And because that we have been changed, people will see Christ in us and want that that we have. Lord God, break us, Lord. Lord, we just pray. You watch over and keep us. We're going to pray now even for the meal, Lord God, that awaits us, that you would bless that food to our bodies, even as you bless those who have prepared it. We love you, Lord, and all God's people said, Thank you, Jesus.